Take a look at this photo. Showing a newly crowned Princess Diana asleep at a royal event, the photo offended some and charmed others, but more than anything, it set the tone for a princess who would break from convention and never fail to stir up controversy. This seems to still hold true 40 years later with Broadway's newest offering, Diana the Musical, a two-hour pop rock infused retelling of potentially the most privileged love triangle in modern history. After talking to a couple of the cast members and reading more about the history, I found that much like Diana herself, the actual journey of bringing the musical to Broadway isn't what meets the eye. So put on your finest Dior and someone resurrect Barbara Cartland because it's time to dive into the tackier of the two musicals featuring royals dealing with awful husbands, Diana the Musical. When I was growing up, there were two things that my mom loved more than anything. Pillsbury Doughboy kitchen decorations <laughs> and Princess Diana. And while the Pillsbury Doughboy musical has yet to even get a reading, the prospect of a Broadway musical centered around the people's princess excited me. The trailers tapped into the style and glamour synonymous with Princess Diana, leading me to believe that it was going to lean more towards an extravagant Evita-esque presentation. But then, <laughs> the movie came out, and the dangers of releasing a pro shot before opening night were realized. The internet exploded, retweeting a clip that looked unlike anything in the trailers. So, call it morbid curiosity or just being stupid, but based on that clip and the number of times I found myself going, what is going on? I knew that it was something I needed to experience live. <laughs> and to make things even more interesting, I wanted to go into it without knowing anything else about it, which meant blocking the word Diana from my Twitter feed and not watching the pro shot right away. Was it nuts? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, after leaving the theater, I don't think I would have done it any other way. We're inevitably not going to get to unpack everything, which is honestly okay. Because more than anything, I want you to walk away from this video with a better understanding of how this show came to be, and more importantly, what its legacy is gonna be. So, let's go back to the beginning and first figure out how Diana made it to Broadway. The creative process for Diana started the way a lot of musicals on historical figures do, with someone reading a biography. This someone in particular was Joe DiPietro, a Tony Award winning writer whose works range from Nice Work If You Can Get It to Memphis, the latter being one of his most notable works that he created alongside founding Bon Jovi keyboardist, David Bryan. The two weren't Diana experts by any means, but they both had the basic understanding that two boys growing up in the 90s would. However, when DiPietro started reading Diana's biography, he learned of the love triangle that ensnared her, Charles, and Camilla. The romantic turmoil mixed with Diana's empathetic soul made DiPietro approach Brian with a bold question. What would he think of turning Diana's life into a musical? When Joe at Joe DiPietro and I were working on another musical, he was, he did some research on Diana. He said, Hey, what if we do a musical on Princess Diana? I went, okay. I said, uh, write a treatment for it. Now in film, a treatment is a document that lays out all the ideas for a certain story. DiPietro's treatment essentially told a story of three people trying to navigate a complex marriage with a powerful mother-in-law, aka the Queen of England. There would be no heroes, villains, or icons. It would be a story of humans, rather than one of royals. DiPietro and Brian linked up with Memphis director Christopher Ashley to bring the show to life at the La Jolla Playhouse in February of 2019 with sets by David Zinn, lighting by Natasha Katz, choreography by Kelly Devine, 
and Costumes by William Ivy Long. Following the show's opening, reviews were incredibly mixed, with the LA Times calling it, no more British than the real Housewives of New Jersey. As the show continued its tryout, general discussions amongst the creatives were focused on the actual pacing of the first act, leading to a lot of retooling. Actor Bruce Dow witnessed these changes taking place firsthand, having joined the production in La Jolla as Diana's butler, Paul Burrell. There, there were characters cut, there were how much backstory. They originally started with Diana as a little girl. They were scenes with her father um, and scenes with her, her aspirations to be a dancer, her uh, interest in the Barbara Cartland novels, her romantic view of Prince Charles as a child. Then that was just eliminated because it didn't, it wasn't propelling things. Um, they decided really to simply fo focus on the marital relationship at that period of time. If there's one thing that the La Jolla Playhouse is famous for, it's the frequency at which it puts out shows that lead to Broadway transfers. So it was never a question of if Diana was going to New York, but more so one of when and where. The answer would come on August 12th, 2019, when it was announced that the show was officially picked up by the Schubert organization and that they were to begin previews at the Longacre Theater in March of 2020. Needless to say, things took a turn on March 11th when the show, along with all others on the Great White Way, had to close down due to the 2020 Broadway shutdown. Everybody was in rehearsals. We were still making some tweaks and changes, minor things, line changes, and people were on their Twitter and watching meetings are happening, stuff's going on. And uh, and then sort of around three o'clock, our, our producer Beth Williams came in and gave one of the most beautiful, caring speeches I've ever seen a producer give about, we have to shut down. We'll see you in two weeks. We're all gonna figure this out. And she was beautifully honest about I don't have all the answers to your questions. This has never happened before. It would be much longer than two weeks. However, the separation wouldn't last forever when seemingly out of the blue, producer Frank Marshall announced that Diana would be getting a pro shot. At this point, the cast wasn't even sure if the show was going to open on Broadway at all. So they were more than thrilled to at least be getting the show preserved in one way or another. And by October, anticipation for the release started growing. We'd seen bits of it backstage on the on the monitors that were there, and it was looking gorgeous. It's really beautiful. We, and then it was just a case of waiting, and, and with every piece you want people to see your baby, you know? And, and how fun is it to have a show on Netflix, you know? <laughs> how fun is it for Mr. 50-something, you know? I've done my Stratford Festival, I've done my Broadway, but I'm going to be on Netflix now, you know. And soon after the release, the reviews started pouring in, and the hate started pouring out. It seemed to become a sprint between news outlets to find out who could make the most references to Mel Brooks the producers. It was a mobbing. The New York Post called it, The Legendary Flop Broadway Deserves stating no flop ever had the stroke of genius to rhyme Thrilla, Manila, and Camilla. And The Guardian described it as a royal debacle so bad you'll hyperventilate. God, theater critics are so dramatic. But after seeing the show live on Broadway, I found myself walking away with a different perception from those who stuck solely to the pro shot. The majority of all reviews focused on one thing, the lyrics. All I have to say is that these are the same writers responsible for giving us the line, maybe you better scram or I'll cut you up like a holiday ham. The difference is that this line was from the Toxic Avenger, a parody musical of the 1984 cult horror film and not a dramatic exploration of Princess Diana's life. While there's no denying that the lyrics were distracting at times, 
I've found more than anything that it wasn't so much the actual structure of the lines that threw me off, but rather their purpose in the story. The show overall suffers from an identity crisis of whether it wants to be taken seriously like Evita or be a light-hearted romp like Jersey Boys. Diana's book and music constantly feel like they're pulling against each other instead of working together in unison. This can especially be seen in the number, This Is How Your People Dance. Up to this point, the show has been relatively grounded, with the song Underestimated introducing us to a black sheep Diana, ready to show the world what she's capable of. Though the tone starts to shift towards comedic with The Worst Job in England, it still manages to walk the line between lighthearted musical fare and melodrama. But then, we get to Diana and Charles attending the orchestra on their first date. And everything changes. The show goes from zero to lunacy, with Diana hopping up on a table, going to town on an electric cello, and making the otherwise reserved Prince Charles do this! Which, as Bruce informed me, was actually based off this incredibly awkward clip of Charles breakdancing in 1985. So at this point, one might say, oh, okay, this is going to be a parody musical, I get it. But after that number is done, the lights go back to normal, and it's like nothing ever happened, <laughs> with Camilla coming out and singing this emotional solo about why she'll never compare to Diana. It honestly makes sense that this was the scene that got pulled from the show and reshared to oblivion on the internet. Because it's unlike anything else in the musical. <laughs> With a tonal shift this extreme, I knew that there had to be some reasoning for its placement that I was missing. Thankfully, Bruce cleared it up for me. This is how your people dance is a dream sequence. There's a very famous shot of Diana asleep at a concert. Um, and it's, it's a dream sequence in which she contemplates the differences between her and Charles and who they are as people. So knowing this inspiration, the placement and inclusion of scenes like this made a little bit more sense. Especially when you think about a number like the main event, which sees Camilla and Diana facing off in a makeshift boxing ring. The reason these moments are allowed to indulge in the camp is because the audience is seeing how the events are unfolding through Diana's mind. The problem is that the show never fully commits to the execution. Thus, these hammy moments feel out of place because the rest of the show tries to play it straight. In an interview with the BBC, Writer Joe DiPietro said that he never approached this as a campy show. He wanted it to be a story about an extraordinary and important woman. But then, you look at something like this. Well, perhaps he just doesn't have the proper horse. And do you have the proper horse? Your Royal Highness, I think you'd adore my horse. Oh. And what else can you call that except camp? And it was clear to me in that moment that even though DiPietro didn't mean to make a cheesy show, it was exactly why so many of us were there. At the few bonkers moments that we were allowed to, we lost our minds. And yet, based on reactions from the creatives, it seems like they're almost disappointed in the camp, and they tried to shy away from it. When in reality, they should have embraced it, because that's where the show really thrives. However, in merely teasing the lunacy, the show comes off as tonally indecisive. Indecision is a word that can be used to describe the show narratively as well. 
focusing on so many different plot points without ever fully committing to one. This leads to an unfocused narrative with a lot of potentially interesting themes more or less just getting dropped. Furthermore, when it comes to the one big theme they actually want audiences to be invested in, the love story between Charles and Diana, the script underdelivers on their romance. This is due to an over-reliance on telling me how the two feel about each other, as opposed to actually letting me experience it. It takes 10 minutes for them to occupy the same space, even though they're very much in each other's lives. It feels like so much of the initial courtship is just them talking to other people about the courtship, which leads to me not really caring about the courtship. Which, I mean, who knows? Maybe it's true that Charles never really loved Diana. But I learned through Bruce that there was originally a scene in La Jolla that actually showed the two meeting at a party. And I think cutting this scene did a disservice to the overall show. It would have been nice to have at least one cute scene that could, in theory, justify Diana's constant running back to Charles while also giving him at least one redeemable trait. Regardless, the uneven and oftentimes rushed narrative somehow leads to an ending that, for me, completely saved the show. The Broadway ending is so much more visceral than the pro shot. The bass rocks the entire theater. Bulbs flash. The chorus cries in anguish that just engulfs the audience. And then, silence. You could have heard a pin drop when Diana walked off stage. Thank God they cut out the part where they all come out and they just go full rent literally singing the theme of the musical for us as they walk towards the edge of the stage, going, here's the theme, Diana! <laughs> Furthermore, the design aspects of this show were superb. William Ivy Long made 35 costumes for Diana alone, which means that she wasn't in a costume for longer than four minutes. It was honestly one of the first times I've heard costumes get that loud of a reaction. On top of that, David Zinn's set was gorgeous, with a lot of fun home-esque trapdoors that brought furniture on and off. In addition to this, Diana has one of the hardest working ensembles on Broadway at the moment. This is a surprisingly athletic show, with the members not only doing high intensity dance numbers in these really heavy costumes, but also having to jump between multiple characters with ease. There were so many times that I was just sitting in the balcony going, how are you breathing right now? So taking everything into account, Diana isn't the worst thing I've ever seen, but it does fail to hit a grand slam. Meaning the question still persists as to why. I think the main reason can be traced back to the development of the show. It seems like the three creatives in charge of telling the story each had their own idea as to what they wanted the musical to be. DiPietro saw it as an 80s infused exploration of Diana's life and legacy. David Bryan saw it as a heavy and dramatic love story. And Christopher Ashley saw it as a young woman trying to find her voice. So when you have these three different ideas, each trying to have their moment, what results is a pretty uneven night, which is frustrating because the one place where everything does line up is at the end, which leads me back to the big question I had leaving the theater. Why did everyone hate this so much? Based off what I heard, I was expecting a wild train wreck, one that would have made Legs Diamond look like Les Mis. So I was honestly kind of disappointed when it was actually fine. Was it a show that had its problems and could have benefited from a few more workshops and having an actual dramaturg on staff? 
absolutely. But was it worthy of getting tweets like, this has made me hate theater, and are musicals bad? No, not even close. We expected it to be polarizing. Like I've said, I have no illusions about any piece of work that I do, that it is the most important and the bestest, you know? Uh, we're humans, we're flawed. If I was surprised by anything, it was the, what I mentioned before, the, the vitriol and the glee. There was one review that was incredibly cruel, and I told them. Not uh, it, uh, personally cruel to me. And, and then there have been some other comments online that were personally cruel and unnecessary. And you just go, I don't care if you like it or you don't. That's not why I do it. It's, it what's worse? You go to the theater and 15 minutes later, everybody's in the bar and they're talking about the new iPhone. Or you go to the theater and 15 minutes later, everybody is screaming about how great or how horrible something was. That's what you want. You want a reaction. We got a reaction. You know. So what is the legacy of Diana? I was concerned because at intermission, I heard a lady say, I may just watch act two on Netflix, which got me wondering if Diana really could spell the end of pro shots. I am still an avid believer that pro shots don't deter audiences. They encourage them. The proof being that I wouldn't have bought a ticket to see this show without the pro shot. And looking around at how many young people were in that audience with me, I think that was the case for them too. Diana the Musical is a show that absolutely nobody asked for, but one that I'm happy exists and that I'm happy I got to see live. Though I don't think it's going to be remembered as a standout for the 2021-2022 season, I think it will go down in history as an important step forward in increasing Broadway's accessibility. It's an enjoyable show that I think will appeal to the segment of theater fans who really like oddball shows, it'll appeal to royal family fanatics, and more than anything, it's gonna appeal to the drunk ants who show up late to wine and cheese nights for years to come. But with that being said, what about another controversial show that opted to take the traditional film route? Did Dear Evan Hansen work? Or was it just another musical misfire? Well, if you click on this video, we can find out. Special thanks once again to all my patrons who have made me doing more videos like this possible. Remember to live truthfully in those imaginary circumstances, and Chester sends his love.